Tonight's presentation is going to be uh, technical interviews for learners. So um, da, 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 let me flip over here. Oh, that's beautiful. So interviews for learners. Um, so close your computers. Make sure um, that you're paying attention to what we're doing up here. Um, I will, this currently is on my local machine, I will post it up on Meetup uh, before the end of the evening. Um, it is focused on the technical aspect of interviews. However, if you're not familiar with interviews and you haven't done a lot of interviews, I cannot hi recommend highly enough looking into behavioral interview questions. Even if you aren't asked explicitly for a behavioral interview question, knowing how to answer them is how you should answer any non-technical question, okay? Um, very, very strongly recommend that. Um, uh, and because we've got such a large group, I'm going to have the questions up in front of you. In an interview situation, you would typically be getting them in an audio fashion. That typically requires a little bit more concentration. Uh, you can't look back to see the details that you missed. You need to actually be listening for them. So keep that in mind as we, as we go through this. Um, and uh, I, so very quickly, um, I have interviewed for five web development jobs and I've gotten four of them. So I've got a little bit of experience and uh, my track record is pretty good on the interviewing side of the house. Getting to the interview, not so good, but the, the actual uh, interview process once I'm there is pretty good. Okay, so um, in my mind, I break down pretty much all web dev related interview questions, technical questions into these three categories. Uh, so your conceptual is your high level. Um, it's the topics. When you see a word uh, that doesn't make a lot of sense and it is being explained to you, that's a concept. So that's the conceptual. The technical are the details. It's the implementation, it's the alphabet, it's the syntax. Um, it's the very, very specific stuff that makes the code run. And then problem solving is the bigger picture. How do you tackle a problem and put these two pieces together to actually come up with a solution? Does that make sense at a high level? Excellent. Thank you for giving me an answer also. Okay, so um, with that in mind, I typically the first two types of questions, I answer with these three things. Like these are my three goals when I answer them. Um, if it's not a correct answer, I'm obviously going down the wrong path. Um, if I'm not answering it clearly, um, then I am not communicating to potential colleagues, and that's a bad thing. If I'm not presenting it in a concise way, uh, I am not, I'm wasting my, my colleagues' time. So those are the three big points um, that I try to hit for the first two. Uh, for the, the third one, for the problem solving, um, when you are in an interview situation and you get a problem solving one, it isn't about the specifics of I would put a semicolon here or I would use a var or a let just uh, for, for no good reason. It is here's how I'm breaking this problem down into smaller sets, smaller sections, um, and now that I've broken it down, I'm going to take this one and I'm going to break it down and I'm going to explain why I'm doing it that way. And so one of the ways uh, this is described is a talk, -th talk through. So literally, normally what goes through your head that you don't say out loud, you say out loud in an interview situation. And it's one of those things that if you've never done it before, it feels really, really weird and awkward. Um, and yet it is absolutely critical. All, three, all of this is geared toward showing that you are going to be a good colleague. That is your goal in an interview situation. Is this somebody who I want to work with? Can they answer my questions? Can they give me a different perspective? So going back to the clearly and concisely, um, if you are interviewing for a position where there are going to be lots of juniors, you're, you're expected to be a mentor, you are probably going to use more simplistic language than you would for somebody where you're going to be the junior member of the team and you need to be able to commute communicate using precise terms because the senior devs are going to understand more quickly and more clearly um, what you mean by using very precise terms. Does that distinction make sense? Yes. Okay. So with that said, um, uh, this will be fun. So uh, I, I'm going to ask uh, one of my more senior folks in here uh, to tackle what is recursion from a uh, interview perspective. So that's when you have a, a uh, for loop and put a continue in it so that you, you know, some of the code after the continue doesn't run. Okay. 
Any, any thoughts on that answer? That's not really <laughs> Okay, so what's, what's, what is um, uh, incorrect, imprecise, unclear about that answer? It was very concise. It was concise, <laughs> excellent. It doesn't have to be the for loop. Okay. It was clear. It was clear. It just wasn't correct. It just wasn't correct. Is it clearly wrong? Uh, so does somebody want to tackle what recursion actually is? I think it's a function that calls itself. Yes. So like I was need to look through an array one time, and I would need to find all of the elements within an array, and if that array had an array, I need to find all the elements in that array. So I just had a function that if an element in the array that it was looping through had an array in it, and it called itself again, then again it, was, it worked. Absolutely. That's good. Get to a base case so that it can Find it out and unwind itself back out of the, the loop. And, uh, Does it always need a base case? Yes. Um, does anybody not understand the concept of a base case? Would somebody like to explain a base case? No, I don't know either. <laughs> <laughs> so what is a base case? So uh, when the function's calling itself, you know, you, you've got to get to a point where it doesn't do it in infinitely. It's got to finally get to a point where uh, it returns from the functions instead of calling into itself again. So there needs to be some condition that you're looking for, um, and then that's the base case. It's that, that condition that once that's true, then you can return, 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 return all the way to the top, and, and whatever the result is should be the answer you were looking for. So going back to the, the tree example, what would um, a base case be in a tree example? Take file directory. The file you're looking for? I don't know. It's either the file you're looking for Sorry. or, what's that? Sorting, uh, sorting pool, the array, or the file. Or there's no file to, to get anymore. Right, right. There, there, there's some terminating event. Um, in the case of a, a tree, typically you've hit what's known as a leaf, um, would be a terminating event. Right? So um, in, that, in that answer, um, I believe I only heard two terms that are precise for JavaScript. One was function and one was return. Can anybody think of anything else that was specific to JavaScript or programming languages in general? Right. All right, yes, somebody did mention array. Right. Um, but otherwise, it was a fairly high level overview of what the thing is. Um, examples were given of trees, files, um, arrays. Uh, so that's your, your high level conceptual. Um, so let's look at a, a, a more technical. So. How many of y'all have heard of factorials? That's a good sign. Um, I'm going to let y'all, actually, no, I'm going to say it out loud. So in mathematics, factorial of a non-negative integer, uh, n, is denoted by n exclamation mark. Um, it is a product of all positive integers, less than or equal to n. So for example, 5 factorial equals 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Um, and that would equal 120. So using recursion, create a function. Remember, this is in a, in a spoken interview, so you're not typing it in. Uh, create a function factorial that receives n and returns an exclamation mark. Um, so uh, from a, an interview perspective, how do you think y'all might tackle this question? One ticket. Is that me again? Yeah, go for okay. it. Uh, so I think you start with two functions. Okay. And one function being the multiplier, and the other function would go through all the numbers. Uh, which one would be the, the one that's your recursive function? Uh, the one that goes through all the numbers. Okay. Can you be ever so slightly more precise? No. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I, I want y'all to know, Ken is a senior level developer, um, and you, you can see how flustered he is uh, at this point. So I, my point is, it is okay to be flustered in an interview. Um, it happens. It happens to all of us. At some point or another, it happens to all of us. Um, 
So yes, in this case, sometimes you can have a recursive function uh, that you call directly and it's going to call itself until you hit the end case. In some cases, you, you'll need two functions. So you, you have your initial function uh, that will uh, make the call to the recursive function that will then run until it reaches an end point. Does that make sense? Any questions from, no? Okay. Okay, so now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw a more challenging question out there. Remember? Yes? Do you have to do it with two functions? What's that? Do you have to do that? You do. Do you want with two functions? Um, I believe so. No, you do not. Um, Could you just return back? Yes. N times factorial N minus Yes. Yes, you can. Sorry, I actually changed up the, the function that I was doing. The one that I initially had did, actually did have two. Y'all are correct. Thank you. Did I, actually, does anybody want to go into more detail on that? Uh, just that plus the base case. Okay. And maybe checking the integer. Say that again? Maybe checking the integer. Uh, yes. So having some checks on it. Okay, so now I'm going to throw you the, the, the curveball one. Okay, so again, I'm going to read this one out loud, but y'all can see it on the screen. Um, there's a contagious infection making rounds. It quickly becomes clear that there are two types of individuals. Um, there are those who are susceptible, the majority of the population, and those who are carriers, the minority. Uh, those who are susceptible will uh, contract the infection. They're sick for several weeks before they return to health. Um, they are only contagious while they are sick, um, and they can be reinfected. Uh, the carriers get the, the infection, they are asymptomatic, uh, however, they are permanently contagious. Uh, this causes a problem nationwide for, for the workforce. Uh, so, you know, researchers go out there, they find an immunization, uh, and while it will cure the carriers, it kills everybody else. <laughs> so we need, to, we need to pick who we give this immunization to rather uh, uh, precisely. Um, so how, would you identify the, the type B people as quickly as possible? Like my knee-jerk reaction is to say to infect them and then watch for the symptoms, and if they don't have symptoms, then give them the, the immunization. Okay. Um, but then that means you're going to make an, an awful lot of people sick in the process. But that's just my first reaction. Um, do we know what the, let's just say we have a type A person, do we have any information on how what percentage of the time they're going to be infected if they're exposed to the disease? Uh, a couple of weeks, I think. A couple of weeks? Yeah. Uh, yes, well, several weeks. But I guess, like, let's just say that they, if they're exposed, yeah, like, or like, are they always infected if they're exposed to it? Uh, good question. If they're not? Good question. Um, so since that isn't given, um, I'm going to say you, you can either choose how you want to tackle it. Um, I'm not going to give you more precision at this point. Why, why do you think that's important from, a, from an algorithm solving this perspective? Um, let's just say that if we had a room of people and there's one type B person and we and basically had germs exchanged with everyone, then, and we knew that everyone who, would, who got those germs, if they were type A, would be sick, then we could do it. Like you said, we could infect everyone and then we could figure out whoever wasn't sick was a type B. Okay. But if it's a lower percentage, then you're going to have to have a longer period of time. Longer incubation, yeah. To be sure. And at some point, if you'll probably end up killing some type A people who just got lucky and didn't get, get sick. <laughs> okay. yeah. well, it, says, it says they do contract the infection, so I'm going to assume that that's 100%. Yeah. But yeah, that, that would be my <laughs> solution, is to infect everyone, watch for the symptoms, inoculate or immunize the, the people who don't show symptoms and quarantine everybody else for two weeks until we, we until you, until you figure virus. it out. I yeah. saw some hands up. I said infect everybody and then wait a few weeks after those two type A's get cured, then get the type I'm sure everybody in the country loves you all right now. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so it's not not far from not far from it, but the, the idea is um, if you have somebody who is already type A, they're already sick, uh, basically you track to see everybody that you can find around them that they have interacted with. Uh, so you're not intentionally exposing people, but you are, you are tracking down those who have been incidentally exposed, and you check to see if they are sick. If they are sick, you 
mark, put them on the, the type A list. We know that they can get sick, yay. And anybody who they've interacted with who has not gotten sick, um, then you either wait a period of time to find out if others are, or if the people that they've interacted with become sick, thus confirming that they are type B, um, or you can be a little preemptive and uh, assume they're type B and, and immunize them. Um, so that, those are two different ways that you can solve it. Uh, one's a little more aggressive. <laughs> um, and uh, I did, I did uh, base this question on a uh, Stack Overflow question. So uh, there, was, there was a little bit of an interesting um, uh, differentiation there. I tried to make it a little bit more simple. Um, okay, so now we're going to go full on group. Um, I am going to suggest that if you are confident that you know the answer, that you, you hold off answering. Um, this is a chance for the folks who think they sort of kind of understand and would like some feedback uh, to, to step up without standing in front of the, the group. Okay. And just, just for the record, that was the plan. I was trying to come up with bad answers that sounded reasonable. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you, you told me that you were going to tell me, I, I will confirm. I did ask him to be a plan. <laughs> okay. So our first question is, what is the difference between a double equals and a triple equals? Who thinks they kind of sort of understand the difference? Okay. So double equals and triple equals are both comparing values. A double equals will typecast in order to get the both values of the same type, but a triple equals will only will compare both the type and the value, and it won't typecast the other value. So. What, are the, what are the implications of that? So in that case, if you had a string with the number, with the digit 5 in it, and if you had the number 5, an equals equals would come back true, but a triple equals would be false. Does anybody have any questions about his answer? Okay. Um, Without being mean, does anybody have any feedback on his response? Um, actually, it's more of a question I should have raised that earlier. Isn't the, the two equal signs means that it would compare two different types, but the triple equals is like deeply equals, which means it needs to be the same type, right? Yes. Okay. So it was a little bit backwards of being described. So um, I mean, it would depend on his audience. Uh, as a senior developer, I, I understood exactly what he was saying. Um, more typically, I have heard the answer, and, and I would give it in an interview. Um, the double equals is a loose equality uh, that does not enforce uh, uh, types. And the triple equals is a strict equality, which does enforce types. Um, strict equality is a better way to describe it. Deep equals is kind of a loaded term because it, it doesn't actually apply to deep equals. Correct. And why is that important? Uh, because you can get into trouble if you think it does. <laughs> um, it, deep equals, yeah, well, it's just a different thing, right? So yep. two arrays do not strictly equal each other if they have the same contents, but they may be. Any other comments, questions on on the answer? Why does double equals exist when I get yelled at for using it? <laughs> <laughs> that, that is a really good question, and I wish that I had a really good answer. I do not. I have an answer. Yeah. Excellent. JavaScript was already created in two weeks, um, so there's bound to be some weirdness. Yeah. <laughs> I think that hits on a good point to his answer is all, like you could improve it a little bit by adding which one would you actually decide to use in your code. Which I, I would argue you should always just use Absolutely. Yeah, I, I actually try to find a compelling reason why you should use a double equals over a triple equals. Um, and uh, short of very intentionally wanting uh, to typecast stuff, there's no good reason to do it. If you want to match null and on the bind, yes, yes. Yeah, I would. I would actually argue. I would actually argue that uh, with developer intent, trying to understand the intent of the person that did it, if it doesn't really matter if you're just checking for falseness or, you know. But if you 
equals equals, it's like you know you're doing some kind of zero or false or something like that that's important. So I don't think it's terrible not to do it, but yeah. Douglas Crawford does think it's terrible to use double equals. Yeah. I think he even says use quadruple equals. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the argument that I've heard against the null uh, and undefined is that it, it goes back to clarity of your code. Uh, did you mean to pick up on both of those? Uh, and if you did, why didn't you just say you know, triple equals four for both of them? And then there's there's no ambiguity. Um, so I and some of that comes down to uh, how quickly you are developing things and how long it's going to last. Okay. okay. So next question. Uh, and again, somebody who thinks they kind of sort of knows. We, we, we've got lots of these for y'all to work through. So who wants to take number one? I'm going to say if this one's true. Number one, it is true. Okay. Why do you think that? Because uh, it's loose. One's a string, one's a number. And uh, they're both the same value. Okay. So. What's that? <laughs> okay, who wants to take who wants to take number two? Who wants to take number two? Lots of lots of maybes. I'll say it's I'll say it's false. Why do you think it's false? Because I think the uh, it's the empty string versus uh, zero value zero. But they're both kind of faulty. <laughs> I would say true. Well, we're gonna find out. So I'll say false. <laughs> I love that uh, it is unknown even among the, the more experienced developers. Okay, so if that is false, what is uh, zero equals empty string? Um, and again, we're still loose equality. Anybody want to tackle this one? I'm going to say true just because you wouldn't ask it unless it was a trick question. <laughs> And that's not actually a bad line of thinking. Anybody else want to comment on it before I? I think it's still false. Does it always pass the second one based on the first one? Yes. In that case, I think it passed. I think it's true when it's always no. Okay. Yeah, that's right. I think it's false. Okay, so I am, I am going to go ahead and throw these out there. I, I'll give you all a second to think about each one before I do it. Um, uh, all of these are, or most of these are up on uh, JavaScript Garden. I do have a link to it in the presentation. Um, and that is a good resource because uh, most employers won't throw you these, at, at least in my experience, but you will have somebody who wants to wants to mess with you. So it does not hurt to know these. Um, and more importantly, it is important to recognize when you might be running into code that's going to cause you problems. Um, so this is a good good way to, to do that. Hey, Sean, would you like go over number three? Why does that prevent data evaluation? Um, yes, so, uh, and, and this is my understanding, zero is uh, recognized as a number there, um, and so it casts the empty string to a number, which is empty, so not zero. So it just, so it casts the empty string to zero? Yes. What's that? No, what strings you convert it to numbers if you convert a string to numbers? And is that number to zero? Like if you can convert a string to a number, it just turn to So if I do numbers, um, Say that again? I think number itself is a function for casting. Uh, 
Uh, like that? Yes. Yes? <coughs> I think so. <laughs> what about so we have zero in a string? Slow zero slow. Just some no, strings. Yes? yes? No, just like a letter string. Just a letter string. Like, like that? Letters, yeah. yeah. I think that's good. Uh, so then, in reverse, if you were to take empty string double equals zero. So this one up here? Yeah. That's quote zero. Yeah. Oh. So if you were to reverse number three. Like that? That's be true. Yeah. That should be true, yeah. Yeah. I think the trick was that it was comparing an empty string to the, uh, the zero character. And those are not the same. No character and zero, the character of zero are not the same, but if it has the character of zero compared to the number zero, then it can do some conversion. Yes. Yes. Anybody got any other questions on those? Number four is really confusing. This is one right here. So if uh, and string zero. So if I'm if I'm doing this correctly, so uh, does anybody want to tackle what a bang bang is? It negates the knot. It negates the knot. And what, what does that end up doing? Making it true? Uh, not or necessarily the true. The opposite. Just like the boolean, I guess. Yes, it, 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 it converts it to boolean. Um, so if we're looking at this false equals, uh, or is it equal to uh, the string zero, this is a good way to see what the string zero is in boolean. Um, I did not expect that. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, so the one that we did was actually a string zero. So I would have expected under the hood, because it's converting to a Boolean, I would have expected that, not that. Did somebody have an answer or an explanation? I, I may have this wrong, but I think JavaScript has all primitives have a two value and two string implicitly, and it does it in a number of circumstances in the background. And like concatenation or double equals, it does some of those depending on what you're checking for. Okay. So the character zero is a character, it's a it's an end value, but an empty string is, is falsy. So what if you do string one came out of false? I think that's what he's saying. No, the, the word oh, capital S. So yeah, zero is false even the character. Like that? Zero. No, it's just it's like you did number, only yeah, string, string. string capital S. But that can start out just Oh, gotcha. String. And then put a false in there. Like that? No. So it's not that. <laughs> <laughs> not that. a better answer on that one at the moment. Um, I am going to encourage you all to, to go through these. Um, I, I do have to ask, does anybody have an idea on this one right here? I'll say it's false. <laughs> I have to admit, I, I don't even have the first clue on my that one. Zero. <laughs> What about the one you Is that regular expression there? No. Well, no. it's just always. It's, tab. it's an empty tab space. Return line piece. Yeah, it's an empty empty space, a tab, a, a return, and a new line. Oh, okay. That's <laughs> And I have no idea why that was zero. Okay, uh, before we go on to the next one, I am going to ask somebody to tackle this one. False. Anybody else? False. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Why is it false? Because we're pointing at different objects. It's not primitive. Does anybody not understand what is being answered at the moment? Two different arrays. Yeah, I don't understand what's being answered. Okay. Um, does somebody want to break it down for somebody who doesn't understand? 
Can I try? Go for it. I think the, z the zero on the left is in br brackets, so it's an array. Yes. And an array is an object. It is an object. It has an address. Mm -hmm. The zero on the right is also an array. It's an object, and it, uh, it has an address. They're two different addresses, so when you're comparing them, they're going to be, I think they're going to be false. That would be. Pardon? They don't look at the same address. Uh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> they're two different objects. Did, did I think that help for us? Okay. For anybody else who was who was not quite sure, does that help clear it up, or are there still questions? Uh, I have an additional. Uh, in the back. No, I just said it was, I understood. You understood? Okay. So double equals would not help in this case, right? Because casting isn't gonna. A triple equals? Oh yeah, no, a double equals would not. It's still yeah. Situation where that is deep equal. Yes. Yes. Those are deep equal to each other. So it is false. And that goes back to the recursion uh, example given earlier of if I'm trying to compare the two arrays, um, I actually need to go into the array because in theory that could be an array itself. And so uh, you, do, you use recursion to go all the way down until you get to a primitive that you can compare. And once you've done that comparison, you pass all those results back up again to determine if your, your parent is equal. Does that make sense? So if you declare the object before comparing them and say a equal 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 a, is that true? Uh, no. So the fact that I have explicitly uh, typed them out here, these will never be equal to each other. Um, now, if I had assigned this value to variable A and I compared A to A, yes, they would be equal because then we are talking about the same address. Yes. Anybody else? I'm not being very good runner. <laughs> okay. Um, I also need to see if there's somebody else um, on the list. It sounds like there's just one. Yes. So who who is the other person in the back? Um, no, you went already. Only one person. Oh, okay. Maybe somebody new arrived. Does anyone have a number less than fourteen yeah. in this room? Uh, yeah. Number eleven. Anyone awesome. less than eleven? Okay. Bring my computer. I bring my computer every day. Okay. So I will say that you will not typically get most of these in an interview situation. These two are pretty likely, particularly as a, uh, a junior developer. Oh, seven and eight? Yes, or eight and nine. Yeah, seven. If you get seven in an interview and they are laughing as they ask you, that's a bad sign. You want to run. <laughs> what, so what is nine? Is that going to be, uh, oh, those going to be different. Those are probably false, yeah. Do you want to take a stab at why? Same thing. They're yep. two objects. So essentially, you have you have two different types of things that you can compare at a really, really high uh, fundamental level. You have what are known as primitives. And uh, yes, from one to seven, we are comparing one primitive to another primitive. Um, and so you can actually use your equality. Uh, for eight and nine, we're using complex types, uh, in, in this case, an array and an object. And the complex types are the ones that the addresses are getting compared, not the contents. Any so, so number four was the one that we were like trying to figure yes. out. Okay. Yes. Yes. So it says that um, this is like in the ECMA International Org. This is all docs. So if so, for x equals equals y. All right. So if x equals equals y. So we're looking at if x is a boolean, return the result of the comparison to number x equals equals y. So it's, yeah, so it's converting, at, uh, yeah, to number x. So false. So it is converting the false to a zero first. And yes. It is comparing the number zero to the string zero, which we yes. already know. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs>
So one thing that I was concerned we wouldn't have time to, to address, um, and we definitely aren't, um, so I'm glad that you did that. So uh, my background is in a field called instructional technology, and when we are designing instruction, the very first thing that we should do, uh, it's kind of equivalent to test development, uh, test driven development, um, is we determine what the learner should be able to do at the end of the training, and then we work back from there. So. Um, Take interview questions, practice interview questions as your end point. If you can't answer them, like you, you honestly don't know the answer, that is a good spot to start learning. That is something to look up and figure out. Does that make sense? Okay. So now on to one of the more high level ones, uh, your, your problem solving ones. So given two arrays of objects, how would you go about returning an array of equivalent objects that appear in both arrays? Um, and I've given you two different examples of uh, uh, arrays. Each one of them has um, objects in it with IDs and names. So we want to find, uh, we want to create a single array with all of the matching objects. Does anybody want to take a stab at how you would answer this in an interview situation? My question. Are two objects using loose equality, are they equal to each other? Would they evaluate as true? Does anybody want to answer that? So like basically the question for, was for like on the example number eight or whatever, where it was like array zero, array equal, 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 array zero. You're asking like if array zero equal, equal, equal yeah. would be true? I don't know. That's, I'm just trying to clarify. So like that, but with the loose equality operator. Right. So, so these are these are false because they're the complex types. Yeah. And so the second you see an object or an array, you know you you can't use your your equals for comparison. And that's the same as the with just the two equality signs too. Yes. Okay. Um, so I guess what I would do is I would probably do. Do I so so I need to check group A. So 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 do I need to check both and then return both. Do I know that I need to return that item at the end or do I need to find the ones that match in both of them? You need to find the ones that match. Okay, so I would do group A and then I would filter through group A for each object. That would be the first thing. And then the filter check is gonna be, I forget, I forget what the actual syntax is gonna be, but I need to check for every object in group A if it is equal to an object in group B, so filter through group A, and for every object in group A, also filter through group B and see if they're equal, and then okay. return the ones that are equal. And when, when you filter through group A, uh, how are you doing that filter? Um, how, like with the syntax with Yes. That? Yeah, I'm real, real high level syntax. I'm assuming I would do group A dot filter parentheses, and then you could say group A item, um, use the arrow, syn arrow syntax thing, and then, so that's gonna mean that you're gonna sort through each one. Then what I'm gonna do with that is I'm then gonna do, I think it's like group B dot includes or something like that to see if it's that. Uh, yeah, if I had a code editor, I could do it. But okay, thank you, thank you for giving it a whirl. Do you wanna, I thought I saw your hand. Oh, are you just waving? Okay. Anybody want to add anything to, to his answer? Anybody? Uh, uh, this is right, but uh, I guess, is there an influence function? I, can't remember. I know there's an index of function, but does it take a callback so that you could do, um, so that you could like tell it how to tell that these two objects are the same? I don't know. <coughs> and if I'm sparking a wrong tree, oh, that includes in, right? Yeah. But I don't think includes works for yeah. for uh, the complex state of this. Uh, it works for arrays. It works for an <coughs> item array, but if the item is an array, like primitive types or an array, array probably. It's not but does index of have a callback? <clears throat> no, it 
And that's, that's the key distinction is we're, we're not only comparing um, the sub-elements of the array, we're actually compare, comparing the key values of each of the objects in each of the uh, array slots. Yeah. Right? Um, and uh, how you would tackle that is, is slightly different. So um, uh, you can iterate over your array pretty simply. Um, you can do a map or a, a filter. Uh, but for the objects, you actually need to deconstruct the objects. And I am blanking on the, the syntax for that at the moment. I guess you guys should. So I mean, it looks like they're in order. So you wouldn't necessarily just search the whole entire array. You just go through it until you get to a certain point. Yes. And it's not going to be in the rest of the array. So, so um, in an interview situation, I wouldn't make the assumption that they, they would be in a specific order, right. but I would feel absolutely justified in asking if that is an assumption I can make, and then going from there. Does that distinction make sense? Yeah, yeah, because by asking the question, you're, you're, you're thinking, you're thinking right. deeper on how you can optimize the, the algorithms. Absolutely. Cool. Any other questions on this one? Uh, so could you use object structuring? Yes. And then, so, and then you could actually access the ID and name and use those um, in a filter, within a filter function? Yes, yes, you should be able to. Absolutely. So I just have a clarifying question, not about this, but you've made some comments about, like, stop asking for details now, but that was a justified one. What's your line for what's justified for detail asking? when they So, do um, uh, asking for details isn't uh, isn't something I would avoid at any point. Like that's that's almost always justified. Um, what you don't want to do is you don't want to get uh, so uh, you're you're in a time limited situation, and so there are things that are fairly concise in and of themselves. So the syntax questions, true, false, that type of thing. Maybe a little bit of explanation um, for something like this. You're not going to verbally write the program. Um, and so it's picking the, the level of abstraction for the answer that you're giving. Does that distinction make sense? Uh, yes. There was lots of hesitation there. <laughs> it makes more sense. Not okay. Yet. Okay. Um, so, yeah. So I would add just one thing to the answer. Yeah. Usually they're, they're looking for your thought process and how you solve something and not the implementation details of it. So like, ask as many questions as you need to feel like you understand what kind of question they're asking and how you might go about solving it. But like, you know, you, as soon as you feel like you're getting into implementation details, that's when you're probably like, okay, I think we can start answering and stop asking. Yep. I do have a question. Uh, and this is a question. Okay, I, I hear this sometimes in some interviews. They ask you a question, and then they want you to, and they want that you solve it, they want you to solve it more complex and then more complex. So maybe the question that I have is like a, uh, it's for everybody like a, how true is that? Because if, if, if you ask, if I have this one, based upon that, I start with two first loop nested. Yeah. After done, okay, two, uh, then I'm gonna use two filters nested. Okay, sounds perfect. After that one, I said, can you, okay, now I'm gonna go with reduce and I'm gonna do some fanciness right there. So but, but my question is, should I go with there. What do you guys advise? Should I go with the hardest one? Should I go because, but, or should I go just the brute force four rooms? Or how do you start? So, um, and this goes back to it, it's a talk through. So literally, you start with well, my my gut instinct is to do this, and and as you are verbally saying that, your brain is still going. you I, I, how many of y'all have had a problem, and you you bang your head on it. And then you've said, I'm done, so I'm done even trying this. You walked off, you did something completely different, and in the middle of doing something completely different, you go, oh, I know what it was. How many of y'all have had that happen? Okay. Your brain continues to work even if you aren't consciously thinking about it. So in the process of talking through what you are um, thinking, your, your, your mouth is several steps ahead or several steps behind your, your brain. And so 
when you say, I'm going to do two loops, your, your brain may already be thinking, wait a second, I can optimize it this way. So if you finish saying, well, I would do the two loops, actually I would now think, thinking about it a little bit more, I would actually go with a reduce or a, a filter. And once I do the filter, I can probably do a reduce. And, and, and so literally by talking through, you are sharing your thought processes. And that, for, for a conceptual question, or for a um, um, uh, problem solving question, it is that thought process that the interviewer is interested in. Um, and that's a really good time to ask clarifying questions because as you go through that thought process, you will, you will run into things that, well, I am, am, do I have a two week incubation? Do I have a week incubation? Those, those are the, the types of questions uh, to, to ask at that point of the interviewer. The other thing that um, I have found in almost every one of the interviews that I've been in is the additional questions that interviewers ask give an insight into what they are actually looking for, not just on that question, but in the job itself. Um, and so uh, the last job, that, or the, the last interview that I went through, um, there I noticed a pattern of CSS questions sprinkled in, but they were slightly different than normal CSS questions. And at a certain point, I'm like, why do you keep asking this type of question? Oh, well, we're trying to go toward a style guidest approach uh, to solving this, and we don't have any experience with it. Do you have any experience? Oh, I don't have it with that, but I have it with this other technology that is comparable. Um, and I, that was one of the selling points. So um, when you start to see patterns, uh, inquire about the reasoning behind the patterns. Partner up with a neighbor. Um, take turns asking each other. I've got three questions. Um, again, one of each type. Uh, the code is off to the, to the uh, right hand side as you look at it, and I'm going to have to shrink it down just a little bit. I apologize for the visual <laughs> challenge. <laughs> Okay.